One cold wintry day in 1860, there was a crowded passenger steamer, and it foundered off the shores of Lake Michigan. And while everybody stood by and watched, a man named Edward Spencer threw off his coat, jumped in the water, swum out through those icy waves, and he did that 16 times and rescued 17 people. After he col collapsed in a delirium of exhaustion, um, Ed Spencer never fully recovered. He had physical problems the rest of his life because of, of that day and broken health. But the real tragedy was this. In his death notice when he passed away, uh, one paper said that not one of those 17 rescued people whose lives he saved had ever thanked him. And it reminds me of the text that we're looking at today in Luke. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Luke 17, starting in verse 11. As Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he looked at them and, and he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, Praise God! And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this four? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. It is easy for us to get caught up in what's going in our life and for us to forget to be grateful. I found five things to thank Jesus for in this passage as I studied it this week. The first is that Jesus is never too busy. Verse 11, as Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. What jumps out to me right away there is that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's got a place to be. Luke makes a big deal for several chapters that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He starts back in chapter 9. Uh, saying that when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so from that point on, pretty much everything Jesus does is put in the context of Jesus being on the way to Jerusalem. And we all know what happens in Jerusalem, right? This is where Jesus is going to be crucified for the sins of the world. We don't know exactly how much time elapsed between this story and Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, but since he arrives in Jerusalem about two days or two chapters later, it's probably fairly close to that time. So we would understand if Jesus was a little preoccupied. We certainly wouldn't fault him for just pressing on and pretending that he didn't hear those lepers yelling at him from across the street. I mean, think about the last time you were getting ready for a big trip, or the last big project you had, or, or waiting for a crucial job interview that you could not be late for. And think about your state of mind. Who would you allow to interrupt you? There's some people, and I'm not going to give their names, they don't live here, so you all are safe, but I have to watch my phone sometimes, because if they call, I know it's not going to be a short conversation, and I have to think about my schedule and what I got to do, because I'm like, I don't have time to talk to them, they're going to have to leave a voicemail, and I'll call them back when I have a little bit more time, but I have to pay attention to that, because sometimes I got too much to do, and I don't have time to talk. That could have been Jesus' mindset, and yet we don't see that, do we? He's on his way to Jerusalem to fulfill the mission for which he came to earth in the first place, and he allowed himself to be interrupted by ten unclean, impure lepers. I'm so grateful that Jesus is never too busy to listen to me when I call out to him. Aren't you? That honestly ought to change our approach to things. As a pastor, um, I notice that sometimes when people begin a conversation with me, they'll say, Pastor Dave, I know you're busy, but... <clears throat> and I'm thinking, am I really busy? I mean, am I pressed for, for time more than Jesus was? Sometimes we feel like we have to prove that we're working hard by always rushing from one thing to the next that we got to tell you know that we always have to make sure people know that that our time is valuable but that isn't resting in god's approval that's seeking after man's approval 
And it isn't serving in Jesus' name either, is it? Because Jesus was never too busy to listen to us. I thank Jesus for that, don't you? He's never too busy. Jesus always answers a prayer for mercy. Look at verse 12. As he entered a village there, ten leopards stood at a distance crying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. If you're a fan of 80s music, you already know the Greek word translated mercy here. The word eleison is in Mr. Mister's song, Kyrie eleison. It means, Lord, have mercy. And it means, it's talking about that emotion that's roused when we come into an individual, come into contact with an individual that has an affliction which is undeserved. Have mercy. So I want you to mentally highlight that word undeservedly because we're going to come back to that in a minute. But for now, let's think about these lepers. They hadn't done anything to get leprosy. And even though the Old Testament law was clear that those with leprosy were unclean, no one thought they deserved it. So essentially, these lepers are crying out, saying, Jesus, let your emotions be stirred by this affliction, which you don't have, but we don't deserve. And do you know that throughout the Gospels, Jesus always answered a cry for mercy? In Matthew 9, 27, there are two blind men that call out to Jesus for mercy, and Jesus heals them. In Matthew 15, a Canaanite woman begs for mercy for her demon-possessed daughter, and Jesus cast out the demon. In Matthew 17, Jesus had mercy on a boy with epilepsy. So did Jesus only show mercy to those who were suffering undeservedly? What about people who were suffering because of bad choices they made? Do we withhold mercy from the alcoholic or the drug addict? And the person that deserves the affliction that they got? In the next chapter, Luke 18, Jesus tells the story of a Pharisee and a tax collector who both went to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee stood by himself, it says in Luke 18, 11, stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat and I don't sin and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. I can, I can hear that Thurston Howell voice there, don't you? I certainly don't sin. But the tax collector stood at a distance and did not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, Oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. I tell you this, Jesus said, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humbled themselves will be exalted. That tax collector earned his sin. He earned his mess, and yet Jesus, when he calls out for mercy, shows him mercy. See, Jesus doesn't just show mercy to people who have suffered undeservably. In fact, mercy is most obvious when we don't get the punishment that we deserve. All of us are sinners. All of us have offended a holy God. And when Jesus comes into contact with sinners who are suffering from an affliction which he does not share, that didn't, I emphasized that sentence totally wrong. I was confused. May I do that again? Jesus comes into contact with sinners who are suffering from an affliction which he does not share. He didn't sin. And so what does he do? He shows us mercy. Isaiah 30, 18 says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. In Daniel 9, 18, Daniel's crying out to God. He says, Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, Jerusalem, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Every time someone calls out for mercy in the Gospels, mercy is given. There's one exception. In Luke 16, Jesus tells the story of a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus. Never once did the rich man lift a finger to help Lazarus in this life. And in the story, both men die. Lazarus goes to heaven and the rich man goes to hell. 
And as he is in torment, he looks up and he sees Lazarus at Abraham's side. And verse 24 says that the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. This is the only time that someone begs for mercy and he doesn't receive it. Why? Because as long as we are living, it's never too late to turn to Jesus. It's never too late. You can't go far enough that you can't find him, that he can't find you. We recognize our sin, we cry out for God's mercy, and we'll receive mercy. But when this life is over, you are out of chances. There is no mercy on the other side of the grave. If you're a child of God, aren't you thankful that Jesus answered your cry for mercy? And if you don't know Jesus, please cry out to him for mercy now. Before it's too late, God gives us our whole life to turn to him. Jesus always answers the prayer for mercy. Jesus kept the law perfectly. Verse 14, he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Now, it seems like a minor detail, doesn't it? But if you look closely, you'll realize this is actually one of the important parts of the story. Why did Jesus tell the lepers to go show themselves to the priest? Because that's what the law required. If you go back to Leviticus 14, it was clear that on the day a leper was cleansed, he was to be brought before the priest. And then the priest would command that a sacrifice would be made, and there was a complicated ritual that had to be followed before the leper could be pronounced clean. And Jesus kept the law of Moses perfectly. He tells us in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. There are a couple times we look and we read and we think, well, it sounds to me like he was breaking the, the Pharisees' law. Well, that's right. He was breaking the Pharisees' law. He wasn't breaking God's law. They had volumes of interpretation of Scripture. So if it said not to work on Sunday, they had to define work and what it was. Like if you were a tailor and you were walking around, you'd forgotten a needle and thread in your lapel. That was work because that's a tool of your trade. If you weren't a tailor, that was okay. They defined all that stuff out. So in the places where it kind of appears and they're saying, hey, you're breaking the Sabbath law, he's breaking their interpretation of the Sabbath law. He's not broken God's law. Jesus didn't take any shortcuts. And that was why he died, had to die for us. The law requires that there has to be an unblemished sacrifice made for sin. Because Jesus kept the law perfectly, he could be that perfect sacrifice. And because there had to be a sacrifice made for sin, Jesus sacrificed himself. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Take a moment. Thank Jesus for keeping the law. We don't think about that too often. Thank him for being perfect and and. And doing what God asked him to do, even the part that required him to be a sacrifice for our sins. Another thing that we can thank Jesus for is that he shows mercy to outsiders. Verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. There they are again. You notice they just keep showing up in Luke's gospel. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? I think when you look at this, you see the heart of the gospel. Since God's word specifies that at one time, what? I'm going to start that one again, too. These pills for this shoulder surgery helped me with my understanding of what I wrote. Since scripture here specifies that one of the nine is a Samaritan, we can assume that the other ten, or the other ten, the other nine, I can do math as well, um, 
that the others were Jews. Now, the Jews were God's chosen people, and the Samaritans, remember, the Jews hated the Samaritans. Back when the Assyrians came in and took over, they moved the Jews out, most of them. They left some behind, and the ones that left behind, they intermarried with the people that the Assyrians brought in. And so when the Jews came back from exile, they were disappointed in their family members because they had intermarried, and they had half-breeds in the family now. And so the Samaritans were, you know, generations down. They were, they were they, the Jews most often called them dogs, you know. Horribly prejudiced, horribly biased. Luke, remember, was a Gentile. So he writes his gospel, and you'll see over and over again, as I mentioned earlier, that Samaritans are in there. And it seems like the Samaritans are always the hero of the story, which, which had to aggravate the fire out of the Jews. They would have expected the Jewish people to respond perfectly every time. And yet, once again, it's not the Jews in the story that respond right, but it's the Samaritan. Now, I have to give the other nine credit. They were not healed when they took off. There were ten guys there. They asked for mercy. Jesus says, go to the priest and show yourself to the priest. So ten lepers started. And on the way, at some point in time, there were no more lepers going to the priests. They were people who had been healed. But the Samaritan looks down and goes, oh, my goodness, my leprosy's gone. He stops going to the priest, and he turns around, and he goes back to Jesus. And he falls at his feet, and he says, thank you. Jesus' question sounds a little politically incorrect to us today. Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? He doesn't say that with disgust. He's not sneering when he says that. He's just saying, where are my people? This outsider is the only one that has come back and said, thank you. Have you ever wondered why the other nine didn't? That could be a lot of reasons, as many as nine different reasons, but one guy speculated these reasons. I thought they were pretty good. One waited to see if the cure was real. One waited to see if it would last. One said, well, I'll see Jesus later. One decided, well, I never really had leprosy. One said he would have gotten well anyway. One gave the glory to the priests. One said, oh, well, Jesus didn't really do anything. One said any rabbi could have done it. One said, well, I was already improving. And once again, Luke points out that the one who was least expected to do the right thing was the only one to respond correctly. Let's look at verse 19. Jesus both heals and saves. I want you to look closely at verse 19. Some of your versions will will say it. It'll be more clear in there than it is in this one. Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now, when we go back to verse 14, and it says they were cleansed, Verse 17, Jesus asked, were not ten healed? The word that's translated cleansed and healed there is the same word. Verse 19 uses a different word. The first word in Greek that's translated cleansed or healed is katharizo. It's the word, it's where we get our word catharsis. And it's only ever used for physical healing or cleansing. But the second word where Jesus said, stand up, your faith has healed you. That word is sozo, which can be translated save. And get this, sometimes it's used for physical healing, but more often it's used for spiritual salvation. The study of salvation is called soteriology. That's where we get that word. Acts 4.12 said salvation, soteria, is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, sozo. So you see, nine of the ten lepers were cleansed. They went to the priest, they did the ritual, they made the offerings, and they received physical healing. However, the law doesn't have any power to save. So all they got was physical cleansing. 
But the tenth leper, this foreigner, didn't go to the priest first. Instead, as soon as he saw he was healed, he came back to Jesus. And guess what? He wasn't just healed, he was saved. Which one are we like? Are we like the nine who didn't have time to show gratitude? Or are we like the one that came back? Grateful for God's goodness in our lives. Are we guilty of not having an attitude of gratitude? If so, we need to confess that as sin before God. Christians ought to be the most grateful people in the world because we, more than anyone else, know who to thank and why. May God help us to thank Him for all things in our life. To thank Him daily in our prayer time, to thank Him all during the day for all His blessings in our life, to express gratefulness to people as well as God for their contributions in your life. Haley Bartholomew um, is a gal that does a TED Talk. One of those TED Talks on the internet where people share and teach and something about something they're supposed to know about. And she gets on there and she shares that how she was so blessed, but she was not enjoying her life. She describes herself as being lost and stuck on a treadmill. And on the advice of a nun that she knew, um, she was told that she should look for something every day to be grateful for. And so she started a project where she was going to take a picture, or take a photo every day, of something that she was grateful for. She said it changed her outlook forever. She always thought of her husband as unromantic, probably like many wives do. (laughs) One day, she took a picture of him, and he was serving dinner. It was her grateful photo for the day. And she went back later and was looking at it, and she noticed that he had given her the biggest piece of pie. And she began to take notice that he always did that. And it was just a small thing, but it was profound to her as she began to see how her husband showed his care for her. And someone asked her husband how it had changed their marriage, and he said that for the first time in their marriage, he was enough. He wasn't always tr- she wasn't always trying to change him anymore. Thankfulness will do wonders for your marriage. She said she also found mothering to be a boring job. She must have had dull kids because it never slowed down at our house long enough for our (laughs) kids to be boring. But as she took photos of her children holding out their hands to her and playing and exploring, laughing, listening to the storybooks, she discovered how much joy and wonder there was in her world. And through the art of gratitude, she found herself lifted out of her rut in celebrating life. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. We do know who to thank. And you know, Scripture gives us promises, Romans 8.28, that even the bad things that happen in our life, God can turn those into good. Which is why in the middle of difficult things, we can say, God, thank you. Sometimes we say it by faith because we don't feel very thankful and the circumstances are hard. But by faith, we know that one day, God's going to use that for good. Whether it's a character quality that he teaches us, whether it's a ministry opportunity that we have one day later, God can use that for good. I look back at things that I hated going through. But I would not be who I am today had I not gone through them. And so I can thank God today for them. Some of those I was able to thank him for when I was in the middle of it. God blesses us so much. And it's so easy to be like the other nine and just get caught up in the moment, enjoy the blessing and go on and forget to stop and say, thank you, Jesus. May we be a people of gratitude. It will change your relationship with God. It'll change your relationship with people. May we be people of gratitude. Let's pray.